I think for most Americans, the question is, on what level can we act to participate in the cultural evolution of our species? I mean, we have the obvious situation of a political system that has failed to act. And in many respects, even failed to acknowledge the questions that we're all asking. Um, I think, as with other people that you've talked to, I think climate change is, it's just, for everyone in the academy, it's, it's an enormous issue. We have produced a situation in which we imperil our own existence, so how, how can we confront that? How can we propel that? We have had a profound impact on the planet. And the average lifespan of a given species, I think, is about three and a half million years. So maybe we've just had our run. Uh, but, you know, it's a shame, right? Humans have achieved this incredible thing called culture, called art, you know, literature. It's just an amazing achievement, and it would be tragic if there were no one to carry it on or participate in it or understand it or, or even care. So I think that's a huge, huge issue. So global warming, how do we confront that? How do we even name that? Uh, there's so many interesting sciences that are coming together around the problem. The guy, I want to say Stockroom or something, I don't have his name right, uh, but the concept of planetary boundaries how one can examine the situation from a rational economic point of view. I think for a culture worker, which is what I consider myself, the question is, how do we, how do we change? How do we change ourselves? So for me, the question of the moment philosophically and culturally revolves around this problematic of the common sense. And I've done some thinking about that on the page, but it's, it hasn't been very satisfying to me, uh, because we have this, this understanding that we can come to a common sense. We can use the apparatus of our bodies to understand what's going on in the universe. We can agree about that. We can call that agreement truth, and we can proceed collectively as a culture on that basis. But unfortunately, you know, we evolved as small group primates. So we have this limit on the number of bodies we can care about at any one time, you know, our small group. A limit on the kind of time that we can think about. Um, can we think about anything beyond the 30 years of a human generation? Can we, can we conceive of that time span? So we have these real built-in hardwired limits now, we've stretched a lot of our hardwired limits through culture and through the cultural pressures on evolution. So, as an art historian, a lot of my questions are, well, what kind of art could we make? What kind of thought can we make? What kind of idea can we make that could stretch the human beyond our stubborn, you know, what the Torah calls the stiff-necked human, you know, beyond our stubborn, selfish, only concerned with our small group kind of parameters. So as I think about this, the philosophers and philosophies that I'm drawn to are those that question the Western obsession with individualism. So those are coming from so many different places and they're reviving so many different kinds of questions and problems that were raised in the 60s. And you know, the obvious players are like that whole domain of left cybernetics that I'm very interested in right now. I mean. Bateson and Frijov Capra and all of these guys who were trying to say, seriously, the cranium is not the limit of consciousness. Our lifespans are not the limit of our impact. And our consciousness has the capacity to expand collectively and to respond, you know, what Deleuze would call rhizomatically. Right? I mean, we, we have the capacity to sense other minds in an ongoing, lively way. And maybe those other minds, you know, are partly produced by the bacteria in our guts, right? I mean, there's so much we don't know, right? There's, there's more 
biomass in our bodies coming from bacteria than from cells that are ostensibly our own. Like we, we just, we really need to acknowledge our profound ignorance and in some sense I feel begin again to craft a culture that will be based on some notion of communalism and interspecies, you know, symbiosis rather than survival of the fittest. I mean, all of these concepts that are there, available, and in some cases fully elaborated by, say, a biologist like Lynn Margulis, but they're still not the central paradigm. They're still not organizing our research. They're still not, you know, they're still not driving our culture and driving our cultural evolution. So that that's what I'm frustrated about. There's so much good intellectual work. There's so much good philosophy. There's so much good biology. How can we, how can we make that more central to what we do? So I've recently tried to grapple with the history of cybernetics. I've come up with an inadequate division of left, left cybernetics, right cybernetics. So what do I mean by left cybernetics? In one sense, it's kind of a pun or a joke. The cybernetics that was left behind. Um, on another level, it's, it's a very, very vague and mushy political grouping that connotes our left coast, California, Esalen, you know, Frizhov Capra on the beach. I mean, uh, you know, what Dave Kaiser calls, you know, hippie, the hippie physicist. Mm -hmm. um, politics is a slippery business. I mean, what do left and right even mean anymore? You know, when the left anarchists are making common cause with the libertarians. I mean, you tell me, right? The libertarians tend to be Republican. The left anarchists, you know, maybe were former Democrats, but I mean, the point is they're, they're, they might be meeting in the middle. I don't know. But for me, the heuristic is we're in a period of right politics. We're in a period of right-wing nationalism. We're in a period of white supremacism. And these are scholars who left us writings that were left behind and that seem to support what we can think of today as left politics, right? I mean, so it's not an adequate term, but it's a way of recognizing that there was a group that were beholden to the military-industrial complex, sometimes very unhappily. And I think Norbert Wiener had crises. I mean, he may have had a little breakdown in there, you know, when he realized his war work was being put to things like the atomic bomb and Hiroshima. I mean, that was a very difficult realization, and he, he swore to the president of MIT he was never going to do that kind of work again, but, but he was stuck there, right? Versus people who were kind of left out, who were, um, again, Dave Kaiser's hippie physicists, who, were, who you know, were stuck with doing theory, who were stuck with pondering quantum mysteries, who did not have a giant lab you know, to create uranium derivatives to make the atom bombs for the future, right? So they were a very different kind of group. And to them became allied some of the biologically minded cyberneticians who also didn't have a place then in the military industrial complex too much. Now, you know, someone like Margaret Mead, Gregory Bateson, I mean, these are complicated characters. So on the one hand, they were complete cold borders. You know, they were working for MoMA, they were figuring out how do we make exhibitions that, you know, lead Americans away from communism, you know. But on the other hand, they were also there as inspiring figures for hippies, you know, radicals, people who were trying to reconceive society in a completely different way. Um, I'm struck by these rhythms of our concern for the climate. I haven't figured them out. But, you know, the rhythm of the early 70s and Earth Day and the, you know, environmental movement in the U.S., you know, uh, what happened to that? The 80s and 90s seemed to just have culture wars, you know, and then, of course, we had 9-11 and it was all terrorism all the time. So we seem to be in another moment when these concerns with the environment are, you know, when we can discuss them again. Partly because there's simply a crisis, right? There's a, there's a crisis of extreme weather, there's a crisis of income in, you know, uh, bad distribution of income, income disparity, and these are all coming together so that the people who are impoverished are suffering the most from climate instability. The problem as I see it is that with these dramatic crises and these dramatic catastrophes, again, the human is limited. The human is not thinking, oh, we have an opportunity to rethink Florida or to rethink Houston, which has no zoning laws. 
which ha which is run completely on a kind of you know cowboy capitalism front. We 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 have no no one is saying should we rebuild the same way. Well, maybe there's someone saying it. No one in the news is saying should we rethink Houston. Should we rethink petroculture? Should we rethink having an oil refinery on the you know on the side of the coast, right? No one is prepared to ask this. According to our current government, it's insensitive to mention the problems of climate change in the midst of catastrophe. So again, we're confronted with our human limits. What I'm trying to do, again, from my tiny position as an art historian, as sometimes curator and a, and a critic, is are there forms of art that help us think in the longer term? Are there forms of culture that help us think across the boundaries of the human individual. So I'm thinking through artists who are working with biology, not in the sense of the positivist, oh, I'm a scientist too, that doesn't interest me very much, but the artists who are working with the frankly phantasmagorical edge of bioart, who are making what I'm calling biofictions, to get us to think about species limits. And for example, in a recent conversation I was having at the Guggenheim with, with a bio artist and a science fiction writer, I just playfully asked, what would each of us have from another species if we could, if we could splice it in to our genes? You know, our cells turn over in our body every seven years. So, you know, you'd start small, you'd splice in a few genes and a few, and a few cells, and, you know, maybe after seven years, you know, they'd, they'd kick in all over your body and you could genuinely be part of another kind of creature. Um, so the artist Annika Yi wanted tentacles, you know, she wanted a kind of octopoid, you know, capacity. Uh, the science fiction writer Jeff Vandermeer wanted echolocation, you know, bat, bat capacities. I want the temporal sensibility of the sequoia. I want, what would it be like to have all of your offspring be clones, to potentially live a thousand or more years, you know, there's an argument that there's some spruce in the northern, you know, hemisphere that has lived, you know, 10,000 years or something. Um, what would that be like? What kind of consciousness would you have of the planet as something you were part of? You know, so the plant, the plant family fascinates me um, because Plants were the first terraforming force. I mean, maybe not the first, but when cyanobacteria came along, I mean, when the first oxygenation happened and the entire planet cascaded from an anaerobic, you know, what we selfishly call anaerobic. I mean, there was some kind of air, but it had no oxygen in it. When it cascaded through photosynthesis into this oxygen-rich environment, it poisoned a lot of bacteria, but it made possible our own evolution, right? So. What kind of consciousness would that allow um, those species? Um, and I don't, I don't think of consciousness in, I don't know, an Anglo-American analytic philosophical tradition. I don't think of it as the trolley problem. I think of consciousness as a much more diffuse sort of participation in the energies of the universe, as some kind of sensing of the energies of the universe. So when I speak to a biologist and they say, oh, you're interested in interspecies stuff. Well, you know, there are papers on that, you know, theories of mind in chimpanzees. I'm like, yeah, but those theories of mind are incredibly limited, right? They don't count, they don't take account, for example, of the intelligence of smell. I mean, what it's like to get information from smell. I mean, humans get information from smell, but we, we're not conscious of it. We don't acknowledge it. We don't have a vocabulary for it. We don't even have a word. We have a noun and we have a verb, you know, smell and smell. You know, that's a big help. Like, we, don't, we can't even distinguish between the active, you know, smelling for something and then the passive smelling of something. We, we, we have no language for that. So, we're limited. And I'm hoping somehow culture can help us, somehow visionary artists can help us. And I, I think the extraordinary artists of our day, like Pierre Huy, um, Annika Yee is just starting out, but I think she has great potential. I think these are really profoundly interesting thinkers that help us on so many different levels of intelligence and you know cognitive processing
you know, think about our place um, in the universe. And I think that's what has to happen. I think art is a, is a kind of a laboratory of consciousness. And I think these are artists who are helping us to get there. Let's think, what are the artists today and what are the artists of the past that have begun to sort of generate this kind of thinking that interests me? And a lot of it connects with cybernetics and systems. So the art of Hans Hacke in the early to mid 60s, before he became uh, you know, the father of institutional critique, interests me very much. He was calling it, well, first of all, he was coming out of post-war Germany. He was very suspicious of humanism. He thought that it had been like, corrupted. I mean, this is my intuition. I think he felt that in Germany, humanism had taken a horrible path and had been used as an excuse for you know, Nazi terror and degenerate art and all the rest of it. So for him, humanism was a bankrupt ideology. So for Hans Hacke, who is not, you know, he's not explicit on it. He doesn't say, he doesn't write a statement that says, I reject humanism. This is my work as a scholar to try and understand this, where he was in the early 60s when he came on a boat from Germany, you know, to the New York Harbor and, you know, arrived with a Fulbright and then got a job and then stayed, right? So he's, He's coming from a place where his entire education as a boy in Germany is steeped in German humanism and romanticism and, you know, the greatness of the German language and so on. And it's inside a fascist regime that is making a horror of that commitment. So he's extremely, it's toxic to him at that moment. Which is not to say that it's not in there, right? It's uh, later when he makes this amazing site-specific installation at the German parliament, the newly unified Germany uh, commissioned him to do a, a piece in the, in the building. Uh, he did a piece that is called Dem Volkerung to the German population in critique of the earlier late 19th century slogan to the German, you know, Dem Deutschen Volk, to the German folk. So he wants it to be to the German population, right? Anyone, immigrant, Anyone, they, they get this garden. And then the members of parliament had to come and bring their soil and dump it in there and see what would grow. And when a blue flower grew, he couldn't help thinking of Novalis and poetry from the medieval era and you know, German you know, romanticism. I mean, it's in him. But he fights it with what I think in 1961 felt like the rigor of science, the rigor, uh, the rigor of a secular understanding of natural systems, right? That would not have God in it, that would not have, right? And at one point, a very interesting exchange with Jack Burnham, a brilliant theorist of systems art, whom I think you probably knew. Anyway, Jack Burnham was in <laughs> colloquy with Hans. He gave him a very important early show, and he said, so, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, Thoreau, and I'm thinking of nature, and I'm thinking, and, and, and Hacke was like, no, no, we're not thinking of Thoreau. I won't have anything to do with that 19th century naturalist stuff. I'm thinking about, you know, plastics or something like that, right? He wanted to say, I'm, I'm thinking about the new technologies, and I just don't want anything to do with that. So these are the kind of fragments we have of this anti-humanist, um, compunction and they would they would it was very brief so by 1968 1969 he was there in New York he was with the art workers coalition he you know he was marching against Vietnam he was he was deep into institutional critique he was he was studying the social as a system he was meeting Pierre Bourdieu they, you know Bourdieu was writing about his work I mean everything then shifted towards the social so you can't very well be anti-humanist if you're thinking about the social Although he still brought to it this stringent sense of the system and, you know, secular, rational critique of the system. Um, and part of my effort as a scholar has been to disambiguate these two phases of his career, because he wants the early to be seen as a kind of prehistory of institutional critique, and I think it's actually quite distinct. And I think it has interesting lessons for us today. Yeah. So he was interested in systems because he felt they could redirect our attention away from the human toward this profoundly beautiful, cyclical, time-based event that was happening without us. The classic instance of this is his condensation cube. And I discovered when 
we did a reinstallation of an exhibition he had at MIT in 1967 that he called it Weather Cube, which is super interesting, right? Very different between condensation, which is a kind of thermodynamic category of matter, and weather, right, which is something we all experience. So this is a plexiglass cube, very, very beautifully uh, fabricated. It has about an inch of water in it, and essentially what is on display is the cycle, the water cycle, between droplets of condensation on the side, a little rain that comes down on the side, you know, maybe a little fog. If you stand in the right place in the gallery, you can see a rainbow in it. You know, I mean, I don't mean a rainbow like, you know, you see it arcing through the cube. You see it through the drops that are condensed on the side. So this modest gesture in 1963 to 65, generated a tremendous amount of thought and continues to generate a tremendous amount of thought um, even today with the artist Trevor Paglin who has done Autonomy Cube which is another another interesting piece but to go back to Hakka he was interested in systems he was reading Wiener he was reading Bertolanffy and he was interested in nature as an isolated system now he hadn't gotten us to the point at all where the human was part of that system Literally, the fact that if I brought my sweaty body up next to the condensation cube, I could change the thermodynamics of that closed system simply by temperature, which is communicating across the plexi. Uh, so he hadn't gotten to that point, but it was a tremendous advance in the thought of how art could direct our attention to a durational process, a system that was going on without us, you know, a kind of autonomous cycling through energies and so on and so forth. So that, that, was, that was really huge. A few years later when he was given the chance to have an exhibition in Germany in Krefeld, he did a Weinwasser, Rheinwasser plant, you know, the Rhine water purification plant, which was literally bringing into the gallery a bunch of carboils of disgusting polluted water. You could see them in the, in the edge of the gallery which were going through carbon filters and cleaning, you know, scrubbing things and coming into a big tank on the floor of the gallery that had a lot of fish in it. Mm -hmm. And the fish were living and they were eating little plants and they were excreting and they were, you know, oxygenating themselves and so on. They seemed to be doing quite well. And this purified water was then coming out of the bottom of the tank and going out of the gallery into the garden behind the art museum in Krefeld. Accompanying that, it's not often discussed, but accompanying that was a full-scale uh, catalog with a map of the Rhine with all of the untreated sewage plants that were, you know, jettisoning human waste into the Rhine, um, you know, along the course of, of the river around that part. So that was the first instance in which he brought the human directly into the system. That was the first instance in which he said the human is changing this natural ecosystem. Here is a system made by humans to deal with that human role in the system. So that too was a very interesting innovation. It was around 1972, I want to say. And it, it again has inspired a range of artists from Helen and Newton Harrison to you know others who, Mel Chin, who, who actually use their art to sort of beta test a reparative or you know reclamation of a certain environmental system. So that was an interesting development. The artists of today certainly are indebted to that systems mentality, but because our times are so desperate, because we've almost left an enlightenment model where the truth will set you free, and it's much more agonistic and contested, ooh, scientists are still debating whether tobacco causes cancer, you know, these aren't climate change, this is the extreme weather events, you know. Oh, climate is always changing, right? I mean, this idea that truth is, is sort of a silly putty that gets, you know, mangled around by politicians, um, it's a much more desperate time. So artists are returning, in addition to this systems, this very clear, this very rational, this very data-driven analysis of the situation, artists are turning to surrealism. So what you're finding are these eerie environments, eerie installations and sculptures that that put you, the viewer, into a very peculiar relationship with the art object. So let's take Annika Yi. She uses, for example, scent and she tells you in her most recent 
2017 exhibition at the Guggenheim that she's made a scent that includes the pheromones from the carpenter ant and the scent of an Asian American female in Lower Manhattan. And you get into the gallery and you smell it and of course smell enters your body. So there's an uncanny penetration of this and you're, you know, the, the squeamish among us may be thinking, are these ant pheromones doing something to me? You know, am I going to turn into, you know, the fly, you know, Jeff Gold, Goldblum, the fly, the classic science fiction novel, uh, movie. So there's that uncanny penetration of your own boundaries as you think about this, this biological material. And then in her, in her vitrines and installations, she has ants in one of them and bacteria in the other. Uh, and part of the interesting process of doing these installations was, was dealing with the museum, which staged a lot of hysteria around putting bacteria into the gallery, which you can imagine. Right? I'm totally grateful to them for taking precautions and isolating this bacteria in the, in the vitrine of the exhibition. But to her point, you know, while they were hassling her about that, the next gallery was being spray painted with some you know, incredibly toxic paint and nobody was doing anything about it going into the ventilation system and <laughs> going into everybody's body, right? So it, it's her way of forcing us to contemplate our separations and our boundaries and whether they need to be renegotiated or rethought. So that's an interesting recent artwork. Pierre Huy is, a, is an artist from France who's doing extraordinary things with the same combination of sort of squeamish creepy, frightening, um, you know, surrealism, Com combining aspects of the undoubtedly real. So there's a real dog walking around. There's a real beehive with bees buzzing around. There's a real, you know, th th this is a reality that we have learned to experience as such in our lifetimes. But they're combined with strange notes and tones that, you know, you have to recalibrate. So they're just, they're extremely mysterious. So. A recent installation that I wish I had seen, I did not, but I've seen the photographic documentation, are a series of fish tanks in which he is suspending volcanic rocks that are lighter than water. So you have this enormous boulder that's sort of floating in the tank. And then there's an artwork that he's crafted, which looks a lot like Brancusi, which he has offered to a hermit crab in the tank and the hermit crab is choosing the Brancusi sculpture to become its home. So this tableau, aside from echoing classic surrealism like Magritte with the kind of floating rock that is just in the middle of the sky, you know, um, aside from that kind of classic art historical reference, this tableau inevitably leads us to think about the posthuman. You know, our Brancusis will tumble into the sea, the hermit crabs will find them very useful, and we'll have no concept whatsoever of their cultural significance. They will be attractive and available homes. So this, you know, this calls up the recent revival, myself included, of Jakob von Uckschel, a great theoretical biologist of the 20s and 30s who was thinking about systems, who viewed species as inhabiting incommensurate life worlds. So he called them Umwelt, you know, Umwelt, the Umwelt, the surround world of the individual individual species. And it's interesting, while we're fascinated by that, we're frustrated with it. I'm frustrated with it. So in, again, a, a Deutsche Fan tradition, um, ja Jakob von Uckschel virtually founded theoretical biology by hypothesizing that each species, each, each individual creature lived in its own Umwelt, its own surround world, that was largely incommensurate with any other creature. Um, and this is because he looked at it in terms of biosemiosis, he looked at it in terms of communication spheres. So the tick, which is his classic example, has a communication sphere that the human cannot understand. The human triggers the communication but completely unconsciously, so that our bodies exude butyric acid, this little whiff of butyric acid comes off our body, and as we move through the, the forest, the tick, who might have been sitting on that stick for 18 years, is like, 
oh my god, butyric acid, I'm jumping, right? It's a signal that the tick receives, jumps onto the warm body going underneath, finds the warmest, nakedest spot, digs in, has the one meal of its life, goes, breeds, lays eggs, you know, whatever. So this idea of the separateness of the umvel is what contemporary, I would say post-Margulis, post, you know, Barella, Maturana, post-Poesis biologists are trying to get away from. Like, are we really so separate? And it's only, I think, in the most recent years, like two years, that scientists are beginning to study how bacteria, for example, contributes to consciousness. So the NIH just approved a major study of gut bacteria and its relationship to mental illness, to depression, to sense of well-being, right? I mean, gut bacteria are participating in consciousness, right? So we are just at the cusp of beginning an entire new realm of science, and I think culture is, you know, pointing the way in an interesting sense of sort of like, how does the hermit crab inform our thinking about this poorly named Anthropocene? So the Anthropocene brings up a whole other set of questions because, of course, it's named after man. So how does the non-scientist contribute to these discussions, right? I will never pretend to be a scientist. I'm a fascinated consumer of science. I am the public, in some sense, for science. I am attempting to be informed about what scientific theories and studies are motivating the artists that I study. So this is my position. So my terms of understanding for science are deeply val value-laden, because in my work and in my understanding of culture, there is no culture without ideology. There is no culture without politics. And I don't mean politics like, oh, was, Na you know, was Andy Warhol a registered Democrat when he put Nancy Reagan on the cover of Interview? Right? I don't mean that. I don't mean that politics in that way. I mean politics as in the polis. I mean politics as in how does this, how is this activity, whatever we're talking about, how is it embedded in culture and in a political reality that it finds itself in? And, you know, today, I mean, we cannot imagine science as being ignorant of that reality when they're being asked to change words in their abstract, when they're being asked to re-describe their experiments. I mean, we're in a deeply political moment. So my, my love of Uxchel, and it's simply an affection, right? I'm not a scientist, so I'm not there to use it as a tool. I'm there to appreciate it as a cultural manifestation. So my love for Uxchel is tempered by this frustration with the concept of the Umwelt, which is plural and incommensurate. So there's the Umwelt of the tick, there's the Umwelt of the human going by, there's the Umwelt of the mollusk buried under the sand, there's the Umwelt of the seagull going by over sea, you know, overhead. They don't, they don't intersect. So I'm, I'm that child of the 60s that's asking, well, can we find another set of concepts that shows how each of these are almost gears in a larger machine. So I'm not, I'm not allergic to the machinic or the systematic. I'm, I'm deeply attracted to them. I want them to encompass more and to admit more of what we don't know. So part of what frustrates me about systems theory is the black box. It's rarely addressed like where you've put the box on your system. You know, what you see in Shannon's beautiful early diagrams is, you know, box, box, you know, circle, you know, message, message, you know, noise, right? It's rarely discussed, well, how does that box get drawn around the message, um, right? It, is the person receiving the message the same kind of person as the person sending the message, right? All of these complicating factors, does, does the word mean the same thing when it get, you know, is it noise if the word doesn't mean the same thing? I mean, so for, for Hakka, for example, the condensation cube is a perfect metaphor for me of the interesting problematics of systems theory. Mm -hmm. Because for him, the plexi box was a perfect box around a system that was autonomous. Mm 
but he had to drill a tiny little hole in the top so that the humidity and the you know temperature you know could equal a lot right I mean there are these interesting little like well actually the box has a little hole because it's actually part of a larger environment and it actually needs to communicate with that larger environment or it won't do the weather cycle and you know so they're they're like it, it does you know it doesn't the box will not hold the black box will not hold and I don't mind that that's that's a heuristic you have to black box things to get any kind of an answer what I mind is the arrogance that the black box describes the universe. I think the most interesting aspect of the cluster of ideas that are circulating around this book is the question of intelligence. So again, as a cultural worker, I'm very, I feel very restrained by contemporary models of intelligence as AI is defining them. I think Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences was a beginning, but I think also questions of sensing outside the cranium, you know, we barely touched. We're sort of obsessed with our neocortex, and it's just part of the human vanity, and I think we need to not make machines that would express the id, I mean, I don't think that's the point. I think the point is to think more thoughtfully about what goes into decision making, for example, besides Bayesian, you know, networks or, quote, rational economic judgments, right? Um, as an educator, there's also an interesting response to all this work. Um, you know, learning is not about binary decisions or facts that can be written into algorithms. You know, learning is a collective enterprise by which we determine how to be better creatures on Earth. Right? So this idea of intelligence as something in a box driving a car, that's just not intelligence to me. Intelligence is something that, again, is utterly dependent on our engagement with each other in coming to a common sense. How do we, how do we, we have to make a commons, and that's what's so, that's what's such a challenge. We have to make a commons or recognize a commons, agree upon a commons, protect a commons. I mean, it's like a whole, there's a whole, you know, Kant took it for granted. So for Kant, it was simply, you know, census communis. It was just out there. We all knew what it was. We didn't have to discuss it. I think now we know how fragile it is and how much of a collective enterprise it is and who we will include in it and even what creatures we will include in it I think is a really important question for right now.